Sorry for the delay. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're here to talk about Senate Bill 5, the Affordable Heat Act, previously known as the Clean Heat Standard. But before I start talking about the bill, I'd like to remind everyone of the actions we're taking to combat climate change. In fiscal year 22 alone, I asked for and then worked with the legislature to secure more than 200 million for climate action. So there's no confusion. I want to be clear. My administration agrees with many of the same objectives as legislators, like reducing emissions from the thermal sector. But how we achieve our goals is where there's a bit of disagreement. I firmly believe we need to help people make changes, not punish them. Last January, my administration was at the table with legislators, listening, engaging, and asking questions about the clean heat standard, then H715. But after months of discussion, it became clear that the bill was not going to get any more specific or provide the details for monitors expected or deserved. At that point, I clearly, repeatedly, and respectfully asked the legislature to include language that after the PUC finished designing this new strategy to reduce emissions, that the General Assembly would put the PUC's plan into bill form and then transparently <clears throat> debate the policy and costs with all the details before any burden would be imposed on Vermonters. From my standpoint, that's what Vermonters expect, deserve, and have a right to receive. Now that was last year, but unfortunately, it appears we're in the same exact situation today, at least in the Senate version. As governor and as elected legislators, we have an obligation to ensure Vermonters have all the details and understand the costs and impacts of what any policy would have on their lives and the state's economy. Last year, the legislature's own joint fiscal office wrote the following in regard to the clean heat standard. And I quote, <clears throat> it is too soon to estimate the impact on Vermont's economy, households, and businesses. The way in which the clean heat standard is implemented, including the way in which clean heat uh, credits are priced and how incentives or subsidies are offered to households and businesses, must be established before meaningful analysis is possible. At the same time, those incentives or subsidies could be costly for the state suggesting larger fiscal impacts in future years." End quote. Again, <clears throat> while I support the work to reduce emissions, we've got to be realistic about what's achievable. Consider the very real workforce challenges we face and make sure we don't harm already struggling Vermonters in the transition. As most of you are aware, I'm an advocate for the transition to electrification. I believe there will be long-term savings as a result, but we cannot ignore the fact that there are significant upfront costs which could be regressive and harmful to low-income Vermonters. A policy like this will require a lot of thought to ensure those who can least afford it are not punished because they have no real choice. At last week's press conference, I gave an example of the Vermonters I'm worried about most. People in mobile homes typically have above ground fuel tanks and they have to buy kerosene at $6 per gallon to prevent gelling in the winter. And if they want to electrify, they'll need to make thousands of dollars in upgrades. And this is money they simply don't have. It's the same for a retiree on a fixed income or a single mom barely making ends meet None can afford to pay a premium on a gallon of heating fuel, whether it's 70 cents or even more. And they certainly can't afford the upfront cost to upgrade their service panels and install heat pumps. We're joined today by Steve Richards of Richards Electric, who will talk through the logistical challenges needed to make this transition. Again, we can't rush into this without a well thought out plan. But first, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Moore to talk about our proposal 
and concerns from the agency's perspective on S5. But before I do, I want to express my sincere appreci appreciation for her dedication, poise, and professionalism over the last few weeks. Julie has been the target of some unfair attacks throughout this process for the simple crime of bringing up potential impacts of this policy, asking questions, and seeking answers, which have been in short supply. Now, Julie doesn't typically tout her credentials, but she's a civil engineer and also has a master's in environmental science and policy from Johns Hopkins University. In total, she served over a decade as a public servant in the Agency of Natural Resources and in her previous stint, helped lead the state's efforts in cleaning up our waterways, which she's still championing today. She's a true expert, and unlike some who are leading the charge on the so-called affordable heat standard, she has nothing personal to gain from it passing or not passing. She just wants to help get it right. That's all we're asking for. We need the legislature to fully understand the impacts of this bill and then be honest with Vermonters about those very real costs and complication. That's it. That's our request. So I'll now turn it over to Secretary Moore to recap the testimony and advice she's been providing to the five members of the Senate Natural Resources Committee over the last six weeks. Julie. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Over the past several weeks, there's been considerable criticism of the cost estimate I provided for the clean heat standard legislation. I stand by my cost estimate and perhaps more importantly, the principles it represents, that government has an obligation to be honest about benefits and costs and that Vermonters deserve transparency. Transitions cost money, real money. To date, my concerns and my cost estimate have been largely dismissed by the legislature and advocates as scare tactics. I see this as unfortunate. My goal in developing a ballpark estimate was to highlight what was missing from the discussion. Careful consideration of the upfront cost of making big changes in how we heat our homes. The fact is that while there have been numerous studies on the need to address carbon emissions generated from building heat, there has not been a detailed evaluation of the clean heat standard, how it would apply to Vermont, and what the near-term cost impact will be on Vermonters. We raised this concern a year ago, and the groups advocating for the program declined to study this important issue. If such work had been already completed around the clean heat standard, we would have the answer to the question that matters most to Vermonters. How is this going to affect my heating bill? The simple fact is, we don't know yet. There is no economic study. There is no fiscal analysis of the clean heat program, and S5 currently contains no cost containment provisions. To be clear, I think we can know these things, but it will take a bit more time. Despite the rhetoric, it is important to remember, as the governor just said, there is no real disagreement between the legislature and the administration on the need to transition from heating our homes and businesses with increasingly high-priced and volatile fossil fuels. Transitioning how we heat our homes won't be easy. It's complex. It requires significant investments, and done poorly will disproportionately affect those least able to afford it, because as the cost of fuel rises, as clean heat costs incurred by fuel dealers are passed along to consumers, fuel assistance benefits will not go as far. My team at ANR has contracted with Heinsberg-based Energy Futures Group to gather more data points and complete needed technical analysis to better understand price impacts and support a thoughtful program design. This ongoing work includes assessing opportunities to take advantage of the tens of million millions of dollars in federal programs to support things like weatherization and installing heat pumps, undertaking technical analysis of policy options for clean heat that evaluate the full cost of implementation, regardless of how much of the cost is borne by fuel suppliers, individual homeowners, or government, price impacts by fuel type and rate impacts on natural gas and electricity, future savings because of changes in heating fuel and electricity consumption, and knowing that costs and savings may not be distributed evenly across Vermont, 
looking at differences between urban and rural areas by income level and impacts on commercial and industrial building heat. The need for supporting policies is also a piece of this work, thinking about residential electrical service upgrades and improvements to grid infrastructure that will be critical to implementation. This work is on track to be completed in June, and absent this sort of work, legislators are voting for an idea, not a plan, and there are real risks to acting hastily. I want to close by saying I care deeply about supporting meaningful and timely climate action. Environmental protection is my life's work. And as a public servant, I feel an incredible obligation to Vermonters to be forthright and make clear that changing how we heat our homes is not going to be simple or free. I absolutely believe we can achieve the desired future state the legislature envisions if we work together. It will, however, take a bit more time to do the necessary homework for something this impactful and this complex. Thank you, and I'm pleased to turn it over to Steve Richard, who will provide a boots on the ground perspective. <coughs> Uh, thank you. My name is Stephen Richard. I'm a master electrician. I've been an electrician for over 45 years. Um, I own and operate an electrical construction and maintenance company down in Hartford, Vermont on the New Hampshire border. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a past president and current board member of the Vermont Independent Electrical Contractors Association. I came here today to discuss the aspects of inst installing primarily electric um, heat pumps from my vantage point as, as an electrician and you know being responsible for a crew of electricians that do this work. Um, I did kind of a, a mini uh, analysis. I looked at one of our customers who happened to be a uh, mechanical contractor that we were wiring a lot of um, heat pumps for. Uh, in the last nine months, we wired over 55 residential heat pump systems at an average cost of $1,300. <clears throat> this was for the electrical only, it did not include the mechanical portion of the project, the equipment, uh, or, or, or any of that. Um, my understanding in talking with the mechanical contractors and uh, with homeowners is that the average costs of installing these systems, residential systems, are more in the range of five to ten thousand dollars, you know, turnkey. Um, <clears throat> that would not include the cost of upgrading the electrical service, which is kind of a choke point. You know, there's only so much available, whether it be a 60 amp service, some of the old services in mobile homes are still 60 amps. Uh, most of them are either 100 or 200 amps. Um, this kind of gets more complicated when you start throwing in car chargers too because now all of a sudden you have a complete electric home that is, has run out of power. So if you've got to upgrade the service, you're, you're in the range of an additional three to $6,000 on top of these other numbers. Um, One, uh, one family member of, uh, of mine who lives in a manufactured home heats with oil. Uh, the oil bill is a significant part of her expenses. Uh, she would have no choice but to pay the extra dollar per gallon surcharge rather than install heat pumps at a minimum of $5,000. She doesn't have the money. There's just, it's no, she would have no, no option. Um, and and I, I can see this uh, being the case for a lot of uh, Vermonters. Um, this does provide work for us as electricians. Uh, it's good work for us. There's no question about that. Um, however, given the current state of um, our, our workforce, um, we don't have the workforce to take on additional work. I mean, if we didn't have these heat pump jobs, we would have other jobs to do. It's, that's not a, um, it's not a huge benefit per se uh, for us. So um, many, 
homes just don't have the electrical capacity to convert to all, all electric. Um, you know, start talking about electric stoves, dryers, hot water heaters, cars, heating systems, cooling systems. Um, it, it's a lot, and many homes are simply not going to be able to uh, add these without significant investment in upgrading their, their service. Um, the uh, the grid is questionable uh, from the people I talk with at the utilities and from what I see on the ground, I don't see where the grid is able to add all these loads. Uh, many people will not be able to pay for the conversion to the electric heat pumps to heat their homes. Um, the speed of converting to an all electric home is outpacing the ability to make the installations, the ability of the grid to supply the added electrical loads and the ability for people to pay for all this. This is obviously from my, my perspective as, as an electrician installing these, these systems. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, we do appreciate your boots on the ground perspective. And I know how intimidating it can be to, to come up here and, and speak to everyone. Uh, but, uh, but I'm sure they may have more questions for you. Uh, but we'll open it up to questions at this point. How many electricians do you employ? Come, come right up, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> we have about 20 employees total of that. Um, probably around uh, 13 electricians and apprentices, right. approximately. And, and how many would you like to employ? Uh, it couldn't happen overnight, but I could see us, uh, um, you know, adding another eight licensed electricians. Uh, over time, we could we could put them to work. Our our uh, uh, customer base is large enough, and the work that we're turning down, we could we could empl employ probably additional eight electricians. And that's without this bill, right? Okay. So how many would this? I mean, well, I mean, it's hard to know. How many, excuse me? How many more would you need to hire, and is there any chance you could find them? Well, there's no chance we can find them. There really isn't. Uh, our, the number of electricians that, that we have is decreasing. Um, you know, we, we max out the number of apprentices that we have to try to bring up through we always have to try to create electricians that way. And even with that, um, you know, the workforce is getting older and they're retiring and, and uh, there's just not anywhere near enough new ones in filling to uh, meet the need. Leaving aside the question of this bill specifically, um, do you think that widespread electrification of home heating is a useful direction for the state to go in? Do you think that's a, a fool's errand given the costs involved with that? I think at the current time, given the cost involved and given the, uh, the difficulties of uh, workforce and um, we haven't really talked about supply chain issues, but there are some of those as well. Um, and just uh, to, to, to see that the grid is ready for it, you know, people's electrical services are ready for it, I, I say they're not at this time. I think that it's the, uh, uh, the push for these, the electrification of these homes is outpacing those, those things. Just ask your opinion about the, uh, do heat pumps today do the job in all weather conditions? Do they heat when it's really cold? Uh, if, if that works, you're the only source of heat. Well, I'm not a mechanical contractor, but I can speak um, just from what I've learned from them and reading and so forth, but, um, and talking with people uh, first, you know, firsthand that uh, when the heat, as it gets colder, the heat pumps have to work harder, okay? And when it gets to a certain point, depending on who you talk to, there's different numbers, but I was talking to a friend yesterday who had heat pumps installed in his house in Vermont, and when he gets to uh, the single digits, he fires up his, uh, his oil burner to 
augment his, his heating in his home. So um, now they, these cold weather heat pumps that they have, which I understand are much better, um, but those have been out for a couple of years now. So I would think that those are going to be making them their way into the marketplace, you know. So to still hear these stories of uh, people not being able to heat their homes 100% with um, these heat pumps is, is a little concerning. <clears throat> A lot of the people you mentioned that were lower income that are able to afford some of the upgrades you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, are you dialed into the state programs that have uh, offered thousands and thousands of dollars to low income Vermonters to be able to do these upgrades? And it, and can the state maybe speak to the amount of money that it has put toward helping low income Vermonters and moderate income Vermonters be able to afford these kind of upgrades? I'm familiar with uh, Efficiency Vermont. You know who they do have rebates on uh, different types of heat pumps. Uh, I'm not aware of any rebates they have for the electrical portion of that, or if there's a service that needs to be upgraded. I'm not aware of any uh, programs they or anyone else has to pay for the expenses in, in, involved with those things. Can someone from the agency speak about whether uh, <coughs> there is money available for such upgrades, and if not, why not? June Tierney, Commissioner of the Department of Public Service. Uh, Kevin, I will speak to that, but I want to get at the premise of your question first. Is there enough, is what we should be asking, not whether there is any. Now, how much money has been put toward those types of subsidies and help is a matter of public record. One of the things that I have found troubling about the discourse to date around this bill has been the failure to look at specific facts and to acknowledge when facts don't exist. So I will not stand here today and attempt to tell you from memory how much money has been put toward these things. I will tell you that it is an above historical amount, and I tell you today it is not enough. So the question is, with everything that we've put toward it so far and the pace of deployment that is envisioned by this law, would there be enough to help the people who are most vulnerable and my judgment today would be no. Isn't the clean heat standard designed to raise revenue that would be able to be put toward that exact issue? One likes to think so, but that's precisely the analysis that is yet to be thoroughly and in a granular way carried out. That's what's missing from the analysis in this conversation. Isn't the PUC charged with doing that analysis? It would be, however, it is also being told at the same time that it must design a program that achieves certain metrics that are laid out in law so that if their honest and searching analysis concludes that in fact those goals are not achievable, they don't have the discretion to design a program that is achievable. So it's not good enough to say, oh, the PUC will figure it out. Governor, um, Secretary Moore mentioned that there's risk in acting hastily on these types of things. Can you speak to how you feel about whether there is a commensurate or even greater risk in not acting quickly enough to address some of these issues? Well, again, just if you recall all the money we put in, I mentioned in my remarks uh, the $200 million uh, that we put into weatherization. We're not, we haven't completed that yet either. I think there's a long ways to go in terms of weatherization. Uh, and there is a path forward as we replace the systems and it becomes more affordable. Uh, people, naturally, I think uh, Steve Richards uh, commented on this, that he, they have customers that are willingly moving forward with, with heat pumps, climate, uh, uh, cold climate heat pumps in particular, uh, this new technology that could make this advantageous. And I believe in the future uh, this could be advantageous to every Vermonter, but I'm not convinced we're there yet. Uh, I'm very concerned, I've said this before, uh, about the grid and the capacity of the grid in certain areas. Uh, I don't think we have to go too far from here. I think uh, I was on a radio program uh, last week uh, where uh, the, uh, the host uh, had talked about uh, his, uh, his uh, car, um, electric vehicle, um, and wanted to put a car charger in his, uh, his home or his garage. 
uh, but the transformer wasn't of the capacity uh, that could, he could utilize one. So, um, and it would be on his dime uh, to replace this transformer, and they're six months out. That's just one, one instance. Um, so, times that by the number of people throughout Vermont that may want this, need this, or may be required to do it, um, that's my concern. Like, are we moving so quick that we can't keep up with the workforce? Are we moving so quick we can't keep up from a supply chain standpoint? Are we moving so quick that new technology doesn't even have a chance? If we had moved this quick three years ago with the, the first generation of heat pumps, I'd say those are outdated now. Same with the electric vehicle chargers. I mean, you, you take the, the level one uh, that were first initiated, the level two, uh, that were in, and then, then came the fast chargers afterwards that are just coming online now. So had we moved forward with them, they'd be outdated at this point. So I think that this has to be a measured approach to be sure we're getting the benefit uh, that we need and not spending money we don't have and impacting uh, Vermonters who don't have the, the upfront costs either. So I just think we, we have to be realistic about this and, and we need a, a plan and we need to know what we're facing in order to do that. So last, oh, okay. Oh, um, Governor, I was just curious, um, you know, I, I heard some, some of the concerns, concerns that you raised about, about this policy and I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, jumping, jumping back, back to that check back provision that you've spoken to several times, you know, if, if the legislature were to put onto this bill a check back provision that would require the policy to come back to the full body and then be approved a second time via bill and statute, do you think that this policy is something that you could support this session or do you have other concerns as well? Well, there have been other concerns, uh, particularly uh, with the, the grid capacity and some of the other things I've learned over the last uh, six, eight months. But having said that, uh, having this debate transparently, openly, uh, with our eyes wide open and Vermonters understanding what the costs and implications are, um, then that would be preferable. And, uh, and I've stated that in the past. So um, unfortunately, uh, there, as, as I read uh, the, uh, the proposal that was passed uh, out of appropriations in the Senate yesterday, it looks like the same language as last year. Um, so that doesn't do it. Um, we sent to them, uh, we um, emailed them exactly what needed to be in the provision uh, for this to come back to the legislature. Um, they didn't do that last year. I vetoed it as a result, um, but now they put the same language back in. So that doesn't do it. Um, it needs to be far more detailed than that. What's the difference between the language that exists that's an appropriation used and the language that's used? It's, it's really, really uh, about, we, we detailed it. It really is about having those specifics um, and having the PUC uh, contemplate that. In fact, this is what we wrote almost a year ago. Um, and this was to the legislature. And this was after they passed it and saying that I, they took care of my concerns about this check back. And uh, the only person they didn't ask was me. So we didn't, we weren't, um, we weren't part of this process. They put in this, this language. So we wrote back to them and, and said, and I'll just take out pieces of this. I'm writing to make clear H715 currently before the Senate on third reading does not address Governor Scott's concern with the clean heat standard. The governor has asked the PUC plan for implementation and pricing, as well as the economic impacts come back to the legislature for review and approval through the legislative process. The current language does not accomplish this. In order for the governor to consider approving H715, it will have to clearly require enactment of legislation to approve how the clean heat standard is implemented, how clean heat credits are priced, the impact on customer rates and fuel bills, and impacts on economic activity and employment. 
And that still holds true today. Today, Still the same. Stand by that. Governor, as, as you know, this was the key recommendation of the Climate Council created by the Global Warming Solutions Act. The clock is sick, as you know, to our, our legally mandated benchmarks. Can you or Secretary Moore speak about what the difference in meeting those climate goals in 2030 or 2050 would be under a clean heat standard and this timeline that you're concerned about versus regulation from AMR as a result of the lawsuit? So I think it's important to keep in context what the recommendation of the Climate Council was, which was to do this more fulsome evaluation of the role a clean heat standard could play. Um, the, if you read the Climate Action Plan, it specifically acknowledges that we don't know what the costs are. And part of the charge to the Climate Council from the Global Warming Solutions Act is to look for cost-effective greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies. So I would argue that the Climate Action Plan itself acknowledged there were significant unknowns when it comes to the clean heat standard. I think that at the same time, uh, other counselors would tell you, and myself included, the clean heat standard is a very interesting approach to what is a complex and challenging problem um, and deserves the level of evaluation um, that it's currently undergoing under contract with ANR. Uh, the 2030 deadline in particular can be really, will be really challenging in this instance. In order to meet the 2030 requirement, um, we've estimated that almost 90,000 new ho additional homes will need to be weatherized. Um, just for context, over the last 20 years, Vermont's weatherized about 30,000 homes. Uh, more than 120,000 heat pumps would need to be installed and about 140,000 heat pump water heaters. So these are really significant increases in the, the number of units um, that would need to be installed. Um, and that's to meet the 2030 requirement. It, it doesn't, it's sort of independent of the clean heat standard. Um, and I think just speaks to the challenge that that requirement presents. Um, and the, the real conversations that need to be held about um, our ability to achieve it um, and our ability to achieve it in light of what we all want to accomplish by 2050, which is decarbonizing both how we uh, travel and how we heat our homes and buildings. In your view, should the legislature, maybe this is a question of the governor, should the legislature be reconsidering this timeline of 2030? Is that something they can or should reconsider? Well, again, we need to have all the facts before us before we can make that determination. I, I don't know. Uh, and that's what we're getting at. We don't have all the data and, uh, and understand what we're getting ourselves into. So until that's done, I don't think we can make that determination. I want to give folks on the phones a chance and then we can come back into the room. We'll start with Tim McQuiston and Rob Business Magazine. <laughs> Hi, Governor. Um, you know, the PUC has basically been large wind production. There's a lot of pushback on how on solar, putting solar in public appeals. I know that Bill Gates, uh, the idea of putting small nuclear plants will work here in Vermont. Uh, China, as you know, is putting a lot of renewable energy. They're also putting a lot of coal plants as, as um, backup. And I was wondering two things. One, has there been any movement on the TDI? Yeah, I think for us, we'll be looking uh, more to the north of us uh, through uh, Hydro Quebec, and uh, and as well, uh, they have uh, some large-scale wind generation there. I think there'll be some off-scale or offshore uh, wind in the uh, lower parts of New England uh, that will come online. TDI is, uh, as I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, is has become very real again. Um, so I have. Uh, I have great hopes uh, that that will be considered, uh, because that would go uh, the new uh, the, the the new proposal would be that it would go both ways uh, that it could bring power in but also bring power back as well. So that makes it uh, interesting. Um, but uh, with all the solar uh, capacity here in the state and growing, 
um, and with Hydro Quebec and with some of we may be depending on uh, some of the lower regions of uh, of New England in the future as well. Um, but but I will say, and I think I made this comment um, a couple weeks ago when I'm speaking to uh, other governors in New England, uh, in the lower uh, part of New England, uh, particularly. Uh, they're more concerned about how are they going to get more natural gas uh, to their plants right now so that they have the generation capacity uh, to take care of the needs right now. Um, so this is a real issue for them. We are in a, a much better position because of Hydro-Quebec and the proximity there. But, um, but they're very, very concerned uh, about uh, just the uh, electric uh, generation right now, and they need more natural gas in order to accomplish that. Um, nuclear, again, uh, you mentioned that you don't think we could do that in Vermont. I'm, I'm, I don't think that should be off the table in the future, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, there's been advancements in, in nuclear, and um, so I think we, everything should be on the table, so to speak, uh, if we're really serious about uh, decarbonization. Well, we, I mean, we have the Connecticut River uh, hydro dams as well. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have any in particular, but I'll let Julie answer, or June. It's the same Julie, maybe in a better position. Hi, Tim, June Tierney here. I was listening to your question, and I, I don't mean to quibble, but I'm not sure I agree with you that uh, things are quite so bad for the development of renewable energy in state. I think the PUC is following a process where they're very carefully examining projects that come before them. And now and again, there is a project where you sort of scratch your head and you say, how did they get to their decision to not permit it? But for every one of those outliers, there are significant numbers of in-state solar projects that are, in fact, being approved. Uh, there is a, a robust conversation underway right now in the Climate Council about the role that um, bio or wood mass plants uh, have to play. We have in-state generation in that area too, and I think the governor's policy to date of supporting that we keep that uh, generation is, um, is sound precisely for the reason that you're raising, but uh, it has its critics. So I think a, a more nuanced view um, of how we produce generation right now and how the regulatory environment is receiving applications uh, gives me confidence that we are in a position to meet our needs. But as the governor correctly points out, in the long term, uh, we have resources to draw on that perhaps our colleagues in other states don't necessarily have readily ready access to, such as hydropower. And there are other concerns, meet, you know, principally about how we meet today's generation in the region and the need for natural gas that deserve attention as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you Is Isabel, uh, 2244? Yeah, I actually have two off topic questions. If anyone with on topic questions want to go for me. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Isabel, you, okay, with your sorry. off topic. Sorry about it. Um, so, I have a question regarding the um, plans to this plan of SDMT and criticism. Um, some organizations are saying that the same cost more than it proposed, um, and that the cost should be put into alternative options, such as communities or lower cost programs. Do you have any point of that? Could you, could you repeat the first portion of that? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about what expansion you're talking about. We're talking. We are having conversations about uh, the replacement of the women's facility, uh, juvenile uh, detention center. Um, but um, 
but beyond that, I'm not, I'm not sure about the expansion. It's more about replacement. Okay, yeah, I believe um, that's what I was talking about then. Um, I must have misread a word somewhere there. Um, but yeah, that's what I was talking about. Um, but you know, if you could maybe talk about you know, why this is particularly needed in the state. Well, the women's facility, um, really from a pr programmatic standpoint, uh, is, is not ideal. Um, where are other models uh, we've been looking at? The main model is one that seems to be getting the most attention. I think we're in agreement that that would be much more suitable uh, to the, for the women's uh, correctional facility. Um, so we're looking at that model and, um, and knowing that we need to upgrade the facility. All our facilities are, are getting older um, and uh, some are in need of replacement. Um, the juvenile center uh, as well, there's some other, uh, you mentioned uh, maybe uh, more in terms of, um, of uh, more localized um, solutions and, and we're contemplating that, uh, in fact, uh, in southern Vermont, um, in both in, uh, in the Bennington area as well as in the Wyndham County area, we are considering both and uh, hope to do a bit in both, uh, both counties. So uh, we're looking for all different kinds of uh, solutions uh, to the dilemma we find ourselves in. But, um, but I think we're having good conversations with the legislature about this and the path forward. Great, thank you, Governor. Sue Allen, Allen Manning Commander. No question? All right, in the room. Yes. Um, Governor, this is pivoting a bit, and this might be a question for Secretary Moore as well, but I know you mentioned the challenges um, around, and this is coming back to S5, um, but the challenges in particular around helping um, you know, folks who live in mobile homes or modular homes um, switch away from that, those fossil fuel heat sources, and also you know, spoke to the particular price vulnerability and energy burden that those households face in Vermont. Um, I know S5, um, as I read it when it came out of natural resources um, this time, there was a provision in there to allow some of the, the credit generating activities, um, replacing some of those, those mobile homes with high efficiency modular options. And then I'm curious, you know, um, from the administration's perspective, if that feels like a suitable path forward. Um, and if not, um, you know, just given that knowing that that is a really, really difficult place in, in terms of making this transition, um, if you see other solutions there. Yeah, that could be the ideal solution in some respects if you try to couple, um, you know, older um, manufactured home um, and then you, you look at uh, what it would cost to weatherize, uh, upgrade the entry uh, at the service entrance um, for the electrical and then install heat pumps and retrofitting and so forth, it could very quickly exceed the value of the home itself. Um, so having another, uh, another uh, unit uh, that is already re retrofitted has a higher amp service uh, and is uh, weather, uh, much more uh, weatherized than the existing home and has the heat pumps already installed, that may be the more practical solution. So uh, I'm, I think we have to, again, contemplate where we're going here and where all this money is going to be generated and how much it's going to cost before we get there. But um, I'm amenable to looking at that solution. I, I would just add that, that I, I think that that's the, the challenge, is that the up, that may actually be the most cost-effective way for addressing the, the needs of a, a manufactured housing resident. Um, but what, at what cost? And what does that do to the value of a clean heat credit and where the revenue would come from to, to cover that cost? We know that replacing those units with more efficient units is, is a significant undertaking. Um, and so again, it's just, it, it is an unanswered question as the governor indicated in a, in a place where additional work and analysis is required. And again, just so we're clear, it, it's not just the home, it's not just the service uh, as Steve had uh, alluded to, the grid itself, having the capacity, the, the, the current available uh, and the capacity uh, to, to service uh, a whole park is, has got to be considered. May I ask a follow-up question, Governor? Sure. Um, I know 
there are real concerns about greater capacity with electrification. Um, and forgive me if I'm asking you to restate yourself, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, do you feel like those concerns are substantial enough that um, it, it would factor into your ability to support this bill or this policy? I, again, I, I don't have any way of knowing that until we have all the details, and that's part of what we have been asking for. Let's let's have our eyes wide open, understand uh, the challenge ahead of us, and and then deal with it. But we don't have all the information at this point. Um, how do you feel about this idea in the Senate to require school districts to provide pre-K to all? four-year-olds in their district or to tuition four-year-olds to a nearby district that does provide pre-K? Yeah, I, I mean, I've talked a lot about uh, cradle to career uh, over the last six years, and that includes uh, integrating our child care into the school system as well, so I'm, I'm not opposed uh, to that. Uh, but the, of course, the devil is in the details, and uh, how do we make sure that our kids have child care in the summer when the schools are closed. Um, there are a lot of details that need to be worked out and, and at what cost and who's going to do it. Obviously child care, one of the big issues in the building this year. What have your conversations look like with lawmakers since the House and Senate have? Um, I am not aware that they've had many conversations with us about our plan. What's your plan? The one we put in the budget. 56 million okay. coupled with everything else. All right. Remember that? Yep, yep, yep. 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 Next door, um, got folks that are uh, rallying for the passage of I think it's Senate Bill 100, the, the zoning uh, bill from Senator Ron Hinsdale, which you yourself call a strong bill. Um, there are some changes to Act 250, which is drawn some concerns from some of the environmental community. I'm, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to look at some of those Act 250 changes. We, we have. I mean, we've been working with them on this bill. We think they're moving in the right direction, and, and it's all needed uh, in order to, to solve this other crisis uh, that we have, the housing crisis. So I think they're moving in the right direction. That's a bill you could support. Yeah, as but, written, but as written now, now I mean, it hasn't gone much further uh, than coming out of the committee. So as we know, it's got a long ways to go. On the floor tomorrow, though, you're hoping On the floor, in the Senate, and then over to the House. So again, long ways to go. Anything you want to say about town meeting next week? Uh, I hope everyone takes the opportunity uh, to to be engaged and to understand what uh, what's at stake with them and their communities. I think the town um, Town meeting day is an institution in Vermont, and uh, we should all take advantage of that. Um, school budgets, I believe all the numbers are in, going to go 7.7% next year. Um, your thoughts on the impact of that growth on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to, inflation is, is impacting all of us in all different sectors, uh, and the school budgets are um, with a high amount of that being in labor, um, it's no surprise that the school costs are increasing. Governor, if I could ask one more question sure. back on energy. There's a bill in the House, I think, that would repeal Global Warming Solutions Act, given that your administration did support it originally and now you're resisting some of the things that the legislature is expecting you to meet those. Is it in committee? Is it being taken out? I'm not sure where it is in the process, but um, is that something you generally support? Or um, you know, I vetoed uh, the bill, as you know. Um, I, for a lot of reasons, I didn't think it was constitutional. I still don't think it's constitutional. Um, but uh, at the same time, we've come a long ways. We've been at the table. We're trying to find solutions. Uh, and I believe that we need to keep marching forward uh, with whatever we do. I, I mean, I, I think we have to be realistic about some of the goals, um, but at the same time, you know, it's uh, the time to stop that was a couple years ago. I have a very serious question. Do you plan on participating in the State House uh, March Madness bracket? Uh, I have not ever done that in the past, um, and I have 
probably no intention of doing it <laughs> this year. You're the first time there. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't been asked either. I haven't been asked to, to be asked included yes. <laughs> <laughs> speaking on behalf of the legislature. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you all very much. Thank you.